Welcome to another terrific program at the Merowith Center. Thanks for joining us. My name is Laura Bryant. This is part two of our two-part series about Social Security. Last week, we heard about the when and how. It was a great intro for anyone who's thinking about applying for benefits in the near future. And if you missed it, we've got a video recording on our website. Today, we're focusing on tips, resources, and fraud prevention. And here to introduce today's guest speaker is Sheila Holmes, Community Outreach Director for the local AARP St. Louis office. We're always happy and excited to partner with AARP, so please help me welcome Sheila back for today's presentation. Sheila, good to see you again. Good to see you too, Laura, and everyone else that's on the webinar today. So as Laura indicated, this is our second program on Social Security and its tips, resources, and fraud prevention. Brought to you by the Mirowitz Center. And um, we're going to go ahead and get started. I had where I was going to introduce myself, but Laura already did that. So I have the distinct privilege of working with the Mirowitz Center on several projects, this virtual program on social, social security being one of them. Make sure to check out the wealth of in-person in and virtual opportunities at MirowitzCenter.org. Before I introduce our expert for this presentation on social, social security, <laughs> I would be remiss if I didn't encourage you to check out the amazing resources ARP has to offer on many topics, including social security. I think you'll be amazed at the tools and resources available on our site at aarp.org slash social security. So without further delay, it's my great pleasure to introduce David Seymour. And for those of you that were with us last week, you know how amazing of a presenter he is. So if you've not seen David, you're in for a treat. So David is the Senior Public Affairs Specialist for Region 7 of the Social Security Administration. He began his federal service as a congressional aide, then later joined the Social Security Administration in the Chicago region. In 2016, David relocated to Kansas City to serve as a technical training instructor for new Social Security Administration employees nationwide. His current duties in the Regional Public Affairs Office include serving as a liaison for congressional offices, assisting with media inquiries, and promoting public awareness and understanding of programs Social Security administers. David also serves as a mentor to Social Security employees and other young professionals through City Year and the Mid-America LGBT Chamber of Commerce. He received his Bachelor of Arts in Spanish and Latin American Studies from Earlham College. This opened the door to exciting international travels, teaching Spanish language and Latin dance, which we have yet to see his moves, in community and academic settings and other meaningful experiences in the public sector. David ultimately received his Master of Public Affairs from Indiana University and soon thereafter embarked on a rewarding career with the Social Security Administration. David, we are so excited to hear what you have on tap for us tonight, or today. It's not night this time. So <laughs> welcome. <laughs> if, it, if it's cloudy, um, it doesn't look like it's cloudy where most folks are, but yeah, it does, may feel like nighttime if clouds are, are around, you know. Thanks for that wonderful intro, uh, Sheila, and of course, much uh, appreciation to Laura and the Mirrorwood Center. Um, the amount of programming um, that I see um, on the uh, uh, newsletters and the emails, it's like, man, I want to go to that. I want to go to that. I want to go to that. So um, it seems like Laura and the team at the Merrillwood Center really do a good job of, of, of bringing a wide range of good folks, right, to, to share resources and information. So I hope to uh, continue to serve in that capacity here today. And today's 
um, talk is really going to be about how to keep yourself safe, right? Um, uh, I have I have received scam calls from social, you know, people purporting to be Social Security or IRS. So I know if I've received them, uh, there's a likelihood that many of you have too, right, on more than one occasion. And so, you know, some of the things that I'm going to say today may seem like common sense. Right, um, and they may be things that you already know. And so one of my challenges to everyone here today is that, um, that you share this knowledge with others. You know, think about others in your life that maybe aren't here today that should be, right? Um, or folks who may not be as connected or well-versed um, when it comes to um, maybe doing business online or, you know, uh, kind of the trends, if you will, as it relates to scams and things of that nature, you know, where you're able to share the information, right? So um, in that vein, I'm going to pull my slides up here uh, momentarily here. Got to get all that connected and there we go. Slide show. There we go. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. There we go. All right, so you can see my opening slide there, right? Good, okay. Thumbs up means I'm cooking with gas, so I, I appreciate that, okay? So um, obviously you can see here on this opening slide that there's a little bit of everyone on this slide, different phases of life, different backgrounds, and that's very intentional, right? But most of us understand that Social Security um, affects all of us at different times in life and in different ways, right? So um, while we won't be doing a deep dive into Social Security benefits today, per se, um, I am going to start out with a bit, little overview, right, just so that we understand the ways in which Social Security is there for the American public. <clears throat> and so we see this kind of uh, journey, this kind of winding pathway, right, through some of life's major events you know, from birth, marriage, when you start working, um, you know, perhaps if disability is a part of the picture, um, and then moving into retirement, and also the future, right? Uh, one of the things I don't get to talk about as much in some of my presentations um, is the future of Social Security. You know, will it be there, not just for you, but also for your grandchildren, right? For your children. Um, you know, those are very real topics. Right, and so we are here, um, uh, despite what a news uh, article may say uh, or a certain thing that you read. We're here to stay, um, and we're doing our best to serve the American public. Right, and so the, I'm going to share a lot of details today. Um, like I said, some of them will be kind of common sense, but um, there may be some that might be just that nugget of information that you need. And just a short disclaimer, right? This information I'm sharing today is correct right, as of today. But as we know, sometimes things can change, right? So um, please be sure to visit our website, right? If you're needing to research a particular topic, um, please be sure to uh, just kind of visit our website and become familiar with some of the information there. So you can make sure you have the most up-to-date information. So a very basic elevator pitch uh, crash course overview of Social Security benefits. Right, most uh, kind of first and foremost, when people think of Social Security, the benefit they think of the most is retirement benefits. Right, that makes sense. Um, the large majority of people who receive benefits from Social Security are retirees. To be eligible for retirement benefits, you have to be at least age 62, and you have to have worked um, and earned at least 40 credits, which is about 10 years of earning. Um, there are benefit increases uh, the longer you wait to file. So the closer you get to your full retirement age, the higher your benefit is. Um, and in some cases, spouses may be eligible um, for an additional benefit. But survivor's benefits are also another category uh, that are very important, right? And, and as the name implies, these are benefits that are payable when someone who is insured, you know, they've worked enough, they've paid enough into Social Security uh, when they pass away. And benefits are payable to a surviving spouse um, or perhaps a surviving divorce spouse in some cases. 
um, minor or disabled adult children. And in some limited circumstances, parents could be eligible if they were dependent upon uh, their child that passed away for at least half of their support. Not a very common benefit. We don't hear a lot about that, um, but we like to make sure um, you know, that we kind of share that and have people have awareness of that. In uh, some instances too, a one-time lump sum death payment of $255 is payable to a surviving spouse or a child, right? Um, seems kind of random. Uh, $255, right? There's a long history to that, but um, we don't have uh, time to go into here today. But um, we like to make sure that we pay benefits to whoever is eligible, right? So we like for people to be aware. Then there's also disability benefits, right? And as the name implies, um, you know, these are benefits that are payable to someone who is unable to work because of, of some type of a physical or mental condition. Right, and they're unable to work substantially. Right, um, uh, for disability benefits, they do have to be insured, meaning you have to have worked enough and paid enough into Social Security to be eligible for the benefit. And um, spouses may qualify uh, for a benefit at that time as well. Okay. Then there's also Medicare. Right. Um, uh, most of us are probably familiar with Medicare, the nation's federal health insurance program. To be eligible, most folks become eligible um, upon age 65, um, and they've worked and paid enough Medicare taxes um, over the years. Um, but individuals who have been entitled to disability benefits for 24 months or more, um, or someone who's been diagnosed with some type of kidney um, fail, uh, diagnosis uh, that requires transplant or dialysis um, and kind of end-stage renal disease um, or folks who have been diagnosed with ALS, right, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. They could become entitled to Medicare earlier than age 65, okay? And similarly, um, if a spouse maybe has not worked enough and paid enough into Social Security, they could be eligible for, a, um, for Medicare coverage through their spouse who did work and pay into Social Security, right? It's kind of rare, but you know, again, uh, we see those situations out there. So all of those things that I just talked about are under the Social Security umbrella of benefits, but Social Security also manages another program um, called Supplemental Security Income, or SSI. This is a federal program that provides monthly payments to individuals who have limited income and resources. Right, so the kicker here is that you have to have, um, you know, low income and resources to be eligible for SSI. So who can get it? People who are 65 or older, um, as well as, uh, as those of any age who are disabled, blind or disabled. Okay? But again, the qualifying factor is having limited income and resources. So that's just a very short, you know, basic introductory overview of our benefits. Right and the and the services that we provide, um, or the programs you know that we administer. And so now let's really get to why we're here today. Right to how can we be more aware of um, the scams right that are out there. Right. So um, of course there's a whole uh, lot of different types of scams. Right. We're going to kind of focus on the ones that pertain most to Social Security here today. And one of the things I like to start out with before we talk about scams is that kind of dispelling that myth, right? Sometimes you'll, you'll hear media stories, um, you'll read things that say social security will never contact you out of the blue. And it's like, well, that's not quite true, right? We do have to contact people sometimes, right? But it's usually, it's usually because you've contacted us first. Right, you've contacted us because you you filed an application, or you're already receiving benefits, um, or you might potentially be eligible for benefits, and we're trying to contact you to secure that application. Right, so we do have to contact citizens. Right, um, and and usually we'll, we'll initiate that by telephone, um, but if of course if we have a mailing address, we will send a notice. 
right, with appropriate contact information in it. But what we will never do is we will not threaten you for information, okay? <laughs> we are not in the business of issuing threats. We have too much important work to do <laughs> than to be trying to, you know, than to try to threaten or coerce individuals, right? Um, we're not going to state that you face potential arrest or other legal action if you fail to provide information. Um, so if if you're if you receive a call and someone is trying to do that, mm, that is not us, right? Um, that is when your red flag should go up, right? And you should end that call, right? Um, the call is probably fraudulent, um, and you should hang up, right? Don't give them any other information. Right? You don't even need to tell them you're hanging up, right? <laughs> this, this is not a situation where you need to be polite. It is quite all right. You could just hang up, right? <laughs> um, because we don't, want, we don't want folks to fall victim, um, you know, to very um, convincing arguments, you know, that the, some of these scam calls can do. And we also don't want them to have an opportunity to kind of prey on maybe some of your vulnerabilities, you know, that you don't even maybe even realize. but. Um, if someone, you know, if they catch you in a moment, you know, um, you know, you might have a vulnerable moment where you might believe a little bit of what they're saying. So here are four signs of a scam, right? Um, I like to call it the four P's, right? Um, it's kind of easy to remember, not the P's that you eat, of course, right? But the four signs, four signs of a scam, they're usually pretending that there is some kind of issue some type of urgent situation, um, you know, and, and that's kind of how they hook you in. You know, did you know that your social security benefits are in jeopardy, you know, or some kind of language like that? They will also, um, in some instances, uh, try to allure you with some type of a prize, right? Or perhaps um, a problem you know, kind of like I was saying, your benefits are in jeopardy or um, perhaps a loved one is in trouble, right? Um, a loved one is applying for benefits and we need your information to complete their application. And that, no, that's, that's not kind of how it works here, right? Um, you might be eligible for benefits, right? Like if your spouse is filing for benefits, and we see that you're married, okay, you might be eligible for additional benefits on that record, but it's not going to be some type of a problem or urgent issue, right? And they will often try to pressure you into doing something, um, you know, either sharing your information, um, you know, or, or uh, pressure you into making some kind of payment to resolve the situation, right? or to make it go away, right? Um, you, um, you know, the, one of the common scams lately has been, um, you know, if um, you do not um, provide us this information or um, issue payment in this amount, um, you know, federal uh, agents will show up to your door, you know, or your social security uh, number will be suspended, right? There's, that's, there's no way to suspend your social security number. Like that's just silly language to begin with. Um, um, now your benefits could be suspended, right? But again, not through this scam. They don't have any access to your <laughs> to your benefit records. Like, you know, they're not social security. So um, remembering those four Ps, I think is a great way um, to kind of help screen those scams. Right, and be aware of what, um, uh, what the what the trick is, or what they're trying to get you to do. So some additional uh, uh, kind of red flags here, right? I've said some of these already, but it's good to just kind of visually see them. We're not going to threaten you with arrest or legal action. You know, suspending your social security number is just not even real. Like that's not <laughs> that's not even uh, something kind of real that can happen um, in most cases. Um, and we're not going to need any additional information from you, especially your bank account information or a debit card in order for you to get an increase in your benefits. 
you know, like that's that's not how we do that, right? If anything, you know, we may need proof of your earnings, you know, if we're looking at some kind of an adjustment on your record, but we don't need your personal or, you know, or payment information. And I'm not gonna pressure you for immediate action or to share your personal information. There is no way for us to seize a bank account. That's just absolute foolishness right there. We Social security is powerful, but we ain't that powerful, okay? So <laughs> we, we don't have that. We don't have that capability, right? Um, and we're not gonna be moving money um, to some protected bank account. And, you know, th these are all very like, you know, these are all very tactics that just prey upon our vulnerability. We're not demanding secrecy. We're not also not going to contact you on social media. Like that is not how we do business. Um, and so if anybody is trying to reach out to you on social media about anything related to social security and you didn't initiate the contact, you know, like, like if you commented on something that we posted on our social media pages, right, you know, um, and then we responded to you, um, one, we're not going to share your personal information um, on social media. Um, if anything, we're going to direct you to one of our field offices, or we're going to share some publicly available information, right? Um, but we're not going to reach out to you on social media. And we're not going to ask for payment, you know, with gift cards or prepaid debit cards, any of that kind of stuff, wire transfers or, you know, none of that stuff. That's, again, we have much more important work <laughs> to do to process people's claims, to make sure you get the right benefit, you know, at the right time than to be engaging in these kind of tactics, right? So those are some red flags. Um, that we definitely want people to be aware of. And again, you know, sometimes we all like a graphic, right? I think sometimes it's good to just kind of see something so we can kind of crystallize on it. This is a graphic for this year's uh, Slam the Scam campaign. This is the third year that our agency, um, uh, in partnership with our Office of the Inspector General, um, you know, who is really kind of the branch of our agency that goes after the bad guys, right? Investigates um, these fraud situations and really tries to tackle these scams. Um, this is our campaign that launched earlier this month. And this is the goal, right? We want folks to hang up, don't give them personal information, and don't trust your caller ID either, right? That's, that's an important one because sometimes uh, these scammers are, are crafty. They know how to spoof. Um, and spoofing means that they find a way to capture the caller ID information um, of a trusted source. They might even do it for AARP, right? Um, I would imagine, right? Because AARP is a large organization. Um, and so, or it might come up as social security, but that, it, that may not be the individual on the other end of the line, right? Um, definitely don't give them money. Um, there's ways to report the scam to our Office of the Inspector General there um, on, on their website or by giving them a call. I um, mean, just really don't believe it. You know, don't believe the hype, as, a, as the old saying goes, right? Um, it's not legitimate. And we'll talk about some ways that where you can verify um, if someone from Social Security is calling, right? So another topic um, uh, that we like to talk about too as it relates to scams, sometimes it leads to identity theft, right? Um, even if you don't answer that call, right? Sometimes there are ways that individuals may obtain um, information about you and do something bad with it, right? So um, it's good for people sometimes to understand the magnitude, right, of identity theft and these types of situation. And in 2023, there were over 5.4 million reports of fraud, identity theft, and similar kinds of activities to the Federal Trade Commission. That's quite a large number. And about, um, it was 5.3 million in 2022. Right. So um, these numbers have continued to climb 
uh, uh, since COVID, right? Especially during COVID time. And um, in 2023, one in five people lost money to these scams to a total of two point, uh, almost $7 billion, right? And I have seen some of these situations come through um, come through our office here in the public affairs, regional public affairs office, right? We have heard of people who have um, thought that they just needed to send, you know, uh, uh, you know, a thousand dollars each month for several years to, you know, uh, entity to keep their social security benefits intact or to avoid um, something happening to one of their grandchildren. You know, it's, it's just, it's so unfortunate, right? And we find in some of these instances um, that again, you know, people have vulnerable spots, right? And it's a combination of those vulnerabilities and not having awareness of how things really work, you know, how business actually is happens with social security or the IRS, you know, or another agency, right? So we definitely don't want anyone here today or any of your loved ones to, to fall victim to this foolishness. So here are some examples, right, of misuse, right? Um, when we're talking about um, examples of, of, you know, kind of like identity theft. There might be some opening of a credit card, um, utility account. Maybe someone is applying for a tax refund or trying to get some kind of a loan. Um, maybe they're even using your information to try to apply for employment, um, which might mean there are earnings showing up on your earnings record that don't belong to you, right? Um, maybe they're trying to get medical care, you know, or or have some other kind of illegal use of your social security number. So, you know, just letting your mind wander a bit, you can already understand the challenges that 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 can create for someone. You know, it can mess up your credit, so you, it makes it hard for you to get any kind of, um, you know, credit cards or a loan if you need it. Um, you may not be eligible for some type of benefit that you might be applying for, medical care. Um, you know, you might start getting letters from debt collectors. I mean, it can it can really get insane, you know, um, and quickly <laughs> um, because sometimes a lot of these things might be happening for a long period of time before you realize it, right, before the first evidence that something wrong is happening. Right. Um, so, you know, the emotional part too, the stress and anxiety of it, the time and expense that it takes to, to kind of, in a sense, clear your name, you know, clear your record, show that, hey, no, that's not me. Um, that could be challenging. Right. Um, and so hopefully, hopefully no one here has gone through this. Right. But obviously, if, if you have um, during our time here today and you feel comfortable sharing some examples of maybe you know, what you went through or maybe perhaps what you helped someone with, you know, a family member or a friend, um, I'd love to hear that, right? So here are some ways that um, we can prevent, you know, elder abuse and financial exploitation, right? Um, we've talked about some red flags, of course. Um, you know, what are some things to look for, right? Those four Ps, right? Um, those are important. Um, taking a look at those things. And then also helping people stay connected and prevent isolation. I, I already know, even though I haven't had a chance to um, participate in a lot of the programming through the Merowith Center and through AARP, I already know that this is a major element of their programming, right? Um, and, and their engagement with communities, right? Being connected with each other um, and preventing isolation is just an all around good thing, right? It's good for our mind, it's good for our souls, it's good for just, you know, everything, right? So staying connected and preventing isolation um, is an important element. Also being very cautious about sharing personal information. This is one that I think applies to 
all of us, right? How many times are we asked to provide personal information? And how many times do we ask why we're being asked for it? Um, and if it is needed, if how, you know, if it is actually needed for what is happening, or if there are some alternatives, right? Maybe we can do something in lieu of providing our social security number, right? Um, in a particular situation. So it doesn't hurt to ask those questions, right? They should, any, any reputable organization should be able to explain to you, you know, why that information is needed and what they're doing to protect it, right? And to keep you safe. We also encourage folks to sign up for direct deposit. The large majority of people, um, I think, do receive their benefits electronically, right? Um, and that doesn't mean that there won't be issues per se, right? You know, things can happen, but it is definitely safer and easier for us to trace and figure out if something does go, does go wrong, right? Having your benefits sent by direct deposit is always the safer route, right? So... Um, you know, if you have perhaps some older individuals in your life, and when I say older, I mean like maybe great grandparent age and beyond, right? Um, maybe they still like that paper check uh, coming in the mail. And I understand there there is something about the physicality of, of things. You know, I get it. I'm I'm that way too uh, to a degree. But um, where you can encourage them to at least have their benefits, um, you know, sent by direct deposit, um, that can be a good move for. Uh, for them. And so what are some things that you can do, right? Um, encourage people to consult with someone you trust, right? Maybe it's calling someone at AARP, you know, or at the Mirawood Center, you know, for assistance, um, just to kind of chat it over, you know, they may have some resources to share or some insight um, about that, but we encourage folks to consult with someone you trust and also shred documents. Don't throw that credit card statement in the trash by itself, un, untorn up, right? <laughs> um, you know, make sure you really do a good job of maybe with a huge black marker and a pen crossing out, you know, your credit card number and your address or whatever other kind of identifying information, right? Do, do take that action to really shred those documents. And shredders are pretty cheap now. You can get one at Office Depot for pretty cheap. So, you know, maybe invest in a, in a little shredder, you know, so that you can um, really dispose of those documents well. And I think the biggest thing is, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, a healthy level of skepticism, I think, keeps all of us safe, you know? Um, and so keep that in mind. Right, as you're hearing um, about things, right? Um, let's see, I just want to take a moment and look in the chat. Oh, thank you, Sheila. Yeah, uh-huh, wonderful. That's great, yeah. Um, incidents of fraud reported by individuals in a geographic area. Oh, yeah, that's a great, I did not know you all had that tracking map, but that's very, very helpful, right? That's great. You know, it's good to be aware, right? Because just when you think it, it's not going to happen to you, uh -huh, it does, right? or it might, right? And so if you suspect fraud, um, there are some things that you can do proactively, right? Um, um, many of you have probably gotten on the National Do Not Call Registry. I know I have. Um, that's a great, um, a good step to do, um, kind of either visiting them online or giving them a call. You can get yourself added to that. And if you suspect some type of fraud or financial exploitation, please don't hesitate to contact us, especially as, if it relates to Social Security in some way. Um, you can, you know, contact our Office of the Inspector General. Very easy to submit a report online. Um, and even if you just go to the website, there is a phone number there that you can also call, right, as, as well to report in case you are not able to report online. Um, and if you suspect elder abuse, um, there is an um, elder care locator number uh, there um, on the slide, um, as well as a website, 
where you can connect with local reporting entities. And I'm sure AARP and Mira Wood Center are familiar with this and other you know, resources that might be a little more particular to, uh, to your area. I mentioned um, briefly, I, I was talking earlier about, um, you know, uh, uh, that when social security does call you, you know, or if, if it might be a legitimate call from an agency, what are some things that you can do, right, to verify that call? And so one is, it is quite all right to uh, feign busyness, right? Or feign, you know, act like, oh, you know what? I'm in the middle of dinner right now, or I'm in the middle of a meal, or someone just knocked on my door. You know, um, can I call you back? Um, and then who would I be calling back? You know, who am I speaking with? Um, what's your title? It's quite all right to ask them some questions, right? Usually, um, if it's someone who is fraudulent, that will be uh, the sign that they can't get over on you. Um, and they will probably hang up before they provide any information about them or where they're calling from, right? If, it's a, if you're calling, if someone from Social Security is calling you, right, we are used to these situations, right? So they should have no problem giving you their name, uh, the number to the office where they are located, right? Um, and the true reason why they're calling, right? Um, and it shouldn't, it should not be laden with any kind of threats or, you know, kind of foolishness. It should be very straightforward. Okay? And um, uh, in many cases, uh, the person from Social Security will likely say something about um, sending you a letter, you know, regarding the nature of the call or, or the reason for the call, you know, if that would make you more comfortable, right? Um, maybe a letter was already on the way in the mail or, you know, um, but there's sh that those should be some elements. So, you know, asking some of those kinds of identifying questions for anybody that's calling you, if if you feel it's suspicious, you know, you don't know them, you're not familiar with the with the circumstances, um, is a is a definitely a good approach. Okay. And so, all right, so kind of what to do, right? Um you you feel like uh you have been a victim, um, you know, you've gotten some evidence of what happened, you know, whether it was, you know, uh Maybe you fell prey to a scam call and you gave away some information, you know, or you got a threatening letter from a, an attorney or something like that. Um, right away, um, it's important that you call the companies where you know the fraud occurred, if you know. You know, you may not know initially, but, um, you know, based on the information you have, try to contact those companies. Play, then place a fraud alert um, on your credit report. Right. And we're going to share some information here about the three credit reporting agencies that you can place, place fraud alerts um, with each one of the credit reporting bureaus. We also recommend that you report identity theft to the Federal Trade Commission or the FTC. Right? And you can uh, visit them online at identitytheft.gov. Right? You may also, based on the circumstances, you may choose to file a report with your local police department, you know, especially if it, if you were robbed, you know, or maybe uh, your purse was stolen, you know, or your wallet was stolen, um, something like that, right? Um, that may be a, a good opportunity for you to file that report with your local police de department. Um, and I mentioned that too, because sometimes the things that happen locally and that seem like it only happened to you just might be part of a larger scheme that you are just not aware of, right? So filing that report, um, not only with the Federal Trade Commission, but also with your local police department, that helps, you know, our, our law enforcement folks track these things, right? Um, so, you know, word to the wise on that. So what happens if you contact the Federal Trade Commission, right, or you go to identitytheft.gov, 
What kind of service do they provide, right? How do they really help you? Well, they're obviously gonna ask you to explain what happened. So of course, as many details as you can share, the better, right? Um, dates, time, you know, documents, whatever is kind of particular to your situation. Um, sharing that information is critical, right? Telling them so that they get a full picture um, or as full of pictures you can provide. And then based on that information and the resources that they have available, they will help develop a recovery plan, right? That is personalized to your situation. Um, and so, and then they'll help you put that plan into action, right? What's the first thing you need to do? What's the second thing? They'll walk you through those steps. Um, and then if, you know, maybe as you're going through it, there may be um, additional things that you discover. And you're like, oh, wow, you know, he didn't know that at first. So they can help you update that plan, you know, change course if need be, um, and assist you with um, maybe issuing letters that may be needed to kind of clarify um, or resolve the issue. Right, so I, I have personally have not, I have had some identity theft issues years ago um, they were relatively minor and I was able to kind of nip them in the bud, thank goodness. Um, and I didn't have to really use the resources here through identitytheft.gov, but, um, I, you know, this is a great service, right? Because especially if you're not, if you don't work in this world, which most of us don't, right? Like we need help, you know, kind of navigating, um, what needs to be done. Right, and they are there. Uh, they are definitely there to assist you in that way. So, what are some things that Social Security does, right, to protect your information, and namely your Social Security number? Right. Well, we protect your Social Security number through a variety of methods, right, and keep your records confidential. So for instance, we don't willy-nilly share your information with anyone, even when they con even when you contact us perhaps for service, there are a number of identifying questions that we ask you um, that um, help us identify you over the phone, right? When you do business with us online, right? We have multi-layered authentication when it comes to your social security account, um, you know, verification, activation codes, you know, those are the things that we have in place to do our best to keep anyone but you, right, from accessing your information. And we talked earlier about, you know, being careful about sharing your number, even when asked for it. And, you know, you know, I'm, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands today, right, but um, there's probably at least one person in the group today that routinely carries their social security card with them, right? Again, I don't need to see a show of hands. We don't need a confessional here today, okay? But I'm gonna strongly suggest that you not do that, right? Um, it's, I would imagine it's very rare that you have to show your social security card to anyone on a regular routine basis, right? So keep that at home. Um, if you know someone, that does this, please tell them to stop immediately, right? <laughs> um, help them find a safe place in their home uh, to keep it there and perhaps other things that they may carry routinely with them, right? Um, it's just so many things that can happen if it accidentally falls out of your purse or wallet. You know, if your purse or wallet gets stolen, you know, um, it doesn't always, Right, like it, 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 I don't want it to seem like something bad always happens if that happens, but oh, you know, we're we're trying to be risk averse, right? As we move forward in life, right? We don't we don't want to add any um you know potential challenges, right? Another thing that you can do from a proactive standpoint is. Um, consider advanced designation of a representative payee. That's a lot of heavy words there. What is this, right? Well, representative payees are individuals who can manage 
your social security affairs for you in the event that you are unable to do so yourself, right? So, you know, if you have some type of, you know, you know, mental impairment or, you know, your abilities are severely diminished uh, for some reason, um, these are individuals that you can proactively tell social security about. And um, they could, um, through an application process, of course, um, be appointed as your representative payee, right? So this can be a way um, as you are kind of doing some of that um, planning, right? For your future, you're trying to get your affairs in order. This can be a way for you to tell us um, up to three individuals. And this is something you can change too. You can go into your My Social Security account, um, you know, maybe one of your individuals you told us about passed away, right? Or maybe you're no longer connected to them like you once were. You can always go in and change, uh, make changes uh, to that. Right? Now, there's no guarantee um, that the individuals would be selected, right? But at least you telling us up front, hey, these are people that I know and trust. That is a better place for us to start as an agency than to just hope that someone reliable um, in your life contacts us, you know, in the event that you're having issues, right, and need, and need assistance, okay? So something to consider there. And some other things, obviously, that we do to help kind of combat all of the things we talked about today, these scams and this fraudulent behavior. Obviously, today's seminar is, is one example of outreach and education, right? Um, we also have lots of great resources on our website. If you type in ssa.gov slash scam, right, there's some great consolidated resources there. There's even a video or two on there that's uh, pretty engaging, right? So we try to make sure that the public is educated um, about Social Security scams, right? Um, even at the top of our webpage, um, when you go to ssa.gov, there's a question um, about, um, have you received a, a fraudulent call? You know, uh, uh, um, what to do if you've received a fraudulent call and it leads you to some resources there, right? Um, in the event that you have had um, some issues, um, we can issue a replacement or a corrected social security number, right, card, right, in case you need that. Um, in some instances, we may issue you a brand new social security number. Right now, that is very rare, right? But it is possible if you can demonstrate to us that you have experienced ongoing difficulty, right? With perhaps your credit, um, with perhaps other, you know, applying for loans or other issues. Um, there are some instances where if you submit that proof to us, we may be able to issue you a new social security number. That does not mean that the old number goes away, okay? So that sometimes people think that, oh yeah, the old number, no, the old number does not go away. So it does not mean that your issues would go away just because you have a new social security number, right? But it can help in, in certain situations uh, to have a new social security number. Right. We can also help by um, verifying what's on SSA records. Right. I talked earlier about um, maybe an instance where there are unknown earnings, you know, showing up on your record, like that you've worked um, somewhere. Um, you know, we can provide proof that no, um, you know, these are the only earnings, you know, that we have for you, or we can give you proof of those earnings that have been reported to us. Right, we can give you that information that can help you in the investigation phase where you're trying to figure out what's going on here, what you know, what's happening, right? And of course, then as a result, we can update your earnings record, we can remove those earnings that don't belong to you, right, from your record. Um, and of course, um, you know, our hotline, you know, making referrals uh, to our hotline, right, and referring you to other resources. Uh, that may be uh, more, maybe beyond the scope of Social Security, right, but can help you address some of the other issues that you've experienced. 
right? And so here's some additional resources. Um, I know I referenced the Federal Trade Commission earlier. Of course, uh, their number is there. Um, you know, sometimes uh, these situations take on many uh, spokes, if you will, like a wheel, right? You've got the Social Security part, you've got the IRS part, you've got, you know, credit cards or, you know, different spokes. So if you've got some things related to IRS, of course, they kind of have a centralized uh, uh, unit there that assists with those things. Um, you know, there's additional prevention tips and free resources on the Federal Trade Commission's website. And um, in some instances, uh, let's say there is fraud going on with your driver's license or your state ID, right? Um, there is a hotline that you can contact um, in that regard uh, to report uh, that kind of a situation. Right? And you can, everyone is entitled uh, to uh, a free credit report um, each year. Um, I believe there's been some changes in that. Um, in recent years, but at least, I know at least once a year, you can get a free, it's, is it three now? Great, all right, that, I knew there's been some changes, but I hadn't quite tracked that, right? You can get those three credit reports uh, at annualcreditreport.com or by giving uh, them a call to request that. And then, of course, here's information about the three credit bureaus, right? Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. Right. Um, you know, I like to remember them by E.E.T. It's kind of a, you know, nod to that movie back in the day. Right. E.T. Right. But E.E.T. Right. Um, of course, you can reach them online. They have numbers there where you can report fraud. I mean, if you need to order that credit report, annualcreditreport.com, though, is a great spot where you can get all three. Right. I believe. Right. You can get reports from all three. But perhaps you perhaps you need to work with one credit bureau because there's it, maybe it was only reported to one or there's an issue with one, you know, so that's why we have that that contact info there. And I want to see here. Uh, I saw something pop up in the chat. Let's see. Gloria said, um, is there a huge agency effort to find scammers and is there any luck doing so? Indeed, indeed. And I'm going to talk about that here in just a second, Gloria. I'm glad you brought up that question, right? Um, so um, before we get to that, though, one other good resource here is USA.gov. Um, this is kind of like a, dare I call it a scam clearinghouse, right? <laughs> but maybe more like a resource a clearinghouse. If you are not sure where to report a certain scam, this tool will lead you through um, some questions so that, in a sense, you know where you need to go, right? Where you need to report it, um, what the issues might be. And it is for like all government agencies, right? So kind of a cool tool. I haven't had a chance to use it yet. I've just kind of read about it, um, but it is pretty straightforward and pretty easy to use. Right, so that can be a cool one um, to use there. And um, and so we'll talk a little bit about the My Social Security account here in a second, um, but I do wanna answer Gloria's question uh, before uh, we move uh, on. And so again, Gloria was asking, is there a huge agency effort to find scammers and is there any luck doing so? And yes, uh, there is. Our Office of the Inspector General uh, that I mentioned earlier, um, they are the branch of our agency that really dedicates their time to um, identifying, eliminating, uh, you know, fraud, waste, um, you know, any, anything criminal in nature as it relates to um, Social Security benefits. Um, and so, um, there is even a, I think really a division within OIG um, that is very focused on scams, you know, tracking activity, um, tracking trends, communicating with other federal agencies about what they're seeing and the scams that they're kind of facing um, and, and linking and partnering 
right? Because it really is a team effort. You know, we can't, this is not an area where we operate in silos, uh, you know, for sure. Um, so, and yeah, there is considerable luck in finding scams and uh, defeating uh, these uh, fraudulent uh, fraudsters. Um, when you go on the Office of Inspector General's website, um, there are often press releases and reports that talk about um, their efforts you know, in identifying and eliminating um, the scam uh, kind of operation. Um, those reports are often very detailed. They talk about the country or countries that might be involved. Um, you know, and sometimes it's just folks right here in the good old US, US of A, right? Um, we don't have to go abroad uh, for a scam to occur. So you can definitely get more information um, there through the OIG website um, about those scams. Yeah, so great question, Gloria. Okay, so now we are going to uh, delve into the world of my social security account. And some of you may be thinking, okay, well, he, he is just sitting up here talking about um, all kinds of scams and, you know, this and this and that, and how people are vulnerable. The last thing I want to do is go online <laughs> based on everything that he's talking about, right? I get it. I get it, right? But the caution and the skepticism that I was talking about earlier, right? We need to have that regardless in our life, whether we're doing business over the phone, in person, or online, right? So we do need to be skeptical and cautious, right? Here is why a My Social Security account is a safe and secure way, right? To really do business with us. Um, part of that is because one, um, when we talk about what it takes to create your account, right? And then what it takes to access your account after you've created it, you know, the only way someone else is going to be able to get into your account is if they have your username, your password, and, and they have your, your access to your cell phone, and or your email address, right? So it, it's gonna be tough, you know, for someone else to be able to get in, um, for someone else to have all of that information, right? And to be able to get in, right? Um, so there's multi-layer uh, authentication um, behind the My Social Security account. And, you know, from a time-saving standpoint, you know, it's, you can log on to your account, get a benefit verification letter, change your address, even file for benefits um, in less amount of time than it takes to call us, wait to speak to a representative. You know, that's not how we want it to be, trust me. You know, we're aware of our service challenges, but at the same time, we don't want people waiting unnecessary amounts of time to do very basic things with us, you know, like, we want you to go and have fun, right? <laughs> go for a walk, play in the park, right? Um, you know, then, then holding up your time with social security. So if you already have a social security account, right? You'll use your existing username and password. Um, uh, and those, that's for accounts created before September um, 18th of 2021. Um, and then um, you may also be asked to uh, log in uh, using your login.gov or ID me credentials. Now, if this is the first time that you've heard of login.gov or ID me, don't fret, okay? These are third party um, identity verification sites that many federal agencies are using, right? As part of their account creation um, and um, uh, validation, you know, making sure that we have the right person. Um, so, um, you know, if you're creating an account for the first time with social, with social security, um, you'll be asked to uh, uh, create your account with login.gov. You'll be directed to their site. This is a snapshot of kind of what it looks like there on the left-hand side. And you'll follow your steps to create your account there with login.gov. Right. They will ask you some personal information. You might have to dig a little bit, you know, for a particular 
document or, or something to kind of verify who you are once you once you complete that verification process you'll be redirected back to our site and then we will send you an activation code right that you will use to log into your account this is likely similar to another online account that you already have right um it's not that it's not that different in terms of how it functions right um so um and that's an activation code that you would receive each time that you log into your account, right? And so if you're not receiving social security benefit, you know, the biggest advantage to having the account is getting in there, looking at your social security statement, right? Reviewing your, your earnings record, making sure you're looking at the estimates of benefits that we could pay you. Right, but you may need a replacement social security card. You can do that online with us. And you can also uh, check the status of your application, even get a benefit verification letter from us to show that you're not getting benefits. Right? Sometimes you need to show that. Right? Those are all things that we don't want folks, you know, waiting unnecessary amounts of time to do, you know, when they uh, when they need to do business with us, right? And, you know, uh, the reality is not everything you need to do with Social Security is necessarily online, right? Sometimes you do have to contact us. So um, our national, uh, you know, uh, call centers are available um, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, for calls. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we have definitely encountered some very significant service challenges uh, that started during COVID and have continued um, kind of multifaceted. Um, we have issues with our phone system. Um, we have issues with staffing. So the list goes on, right? But again, we're, we're still here to serve, but we're doing the best we can with what we got at the moment, you know? Um, but we are also, you may need to visit your office, especially when we're dealing with you know, some of these identity theft and fraud situations, you may feel com more comfortable going into one of our local offices to actually speak to someone. That's perfectly fine. You can find information about your local office. They're using our online office locator if you're not quite sure um, where it is. And um, obviously, you know, we get a lot of questions sometimes about scams and fraudulent activities. Our frequently asked questions aside of our website is a great place to go as well. And you can just search for stuff by like keyword. Um, I think they may, there may even be a grouping. I haven't been to our frequently asked questions in a while, but there may be a grouping that is related to scam and fraudulent activity. And so you can find some good information there. And this is a snapshot of our website. Um, if you haven't been to it before, haven't checked it out in a long time, um, it's uh, relatively newly redesigned, I'd say within the last couple of years or so. Um, hopefully the words that jump out on to you are prepare, apply, and manage, right? That was the goal uh, behind this redesign because we really want people to feel like they can do that when they go to our website, right? We wanted to make things easier to access, um, and information easier to access. So, you know, we're not going to go through all the things on our website here today. We don't have time for that, but I just want to highlight um, some of the drop down menus at the top that are kind of specific. You want to learn more about Social Security benefits, you know, click on that drop down there, Medicare, your, your Social Security card and record. Um, those are some easy ways to kind of get to the information that you need. And then, of course, um, the search bubble. I like to call it a search bubble. It is a great way for me to find things like, and I usually intentionally use it because I like to know what comes up. If I tell someone to search for scam, you know, or if they type in fraud, I like to know what the search results are so that when I'm doing presentations, you know, I can actually recommend that, right? And say, this is what will show up. This is how you can find that information. I'm gonna go back for a second here, because I forgot to highlight the one thing that I should have highlighted here. Um, up top, at the very top of the page, right, that question, what should I do if I get a call claiming there's a problem with my social security number or account, right? We've had that there for quite some time. It's 
changed in look um, and appearance uh, because of our some of our website changes, but that is a great way um, to get right to the source of the information that you may need um, with something that's fraudulent um, you know, or scam related. And a shameless but important plug uh, to follow us on social media, right? We do post good information, um, especially when you follow our pages, right? Sometimes there are fraudulent social security pages out there. So um, don't, don't trust it, right? You can access all of our social media, legitimate social media pages through our website. At the bottom of our um, page, there's a social media uh, corner, I think it says, where you can access all of those. So we got some cool videos on, our, on YouTube uh, that talk about scam, right? And protecting yourself. Um, so, um, you know, sometimes we like to see a video. And you know, sometimes we learn better, uh, you know, through that way. So um, feel free to check us out on the outlet. And I will just kind of pause there. I'm going to take a sip of water here because I've been talking and I like to talk, but I think I need a little water right now. So we'll see if there might be any questions out there. So if you have a question, you can raise your hand, you can put it in chat, um, you can come off mute and wave your hand, go on camera, and uh, we'll, you can shoot your question to David. Um, but in the meantime, I'll ask one, as people are primed, getting primed. Sure. So um, with one particular type of fraud, maybe it falls under the Social Security umbrella is Medicare. Um, there are a lot of fraudulent um, either claims on behalf of someone. And, you know, so do you, are you aware of what process people need to take for a claim such as that? And you may not find, you may not discover it until it's already been going on for a what like my mom here I'll give another example if you were on last week you heard me talk about my mom so um a company said hey we've got this free device that we're going to send you at no cost to you and you can just keep it as long as you want but in the end Medicare is it's a fraudulent claim for Medicare when my mom really didn't need it or didn't request it or wasn't prescribed to it. So what do people do in those cases? Definitely. Yeah. Medicare fraud and issues related to that are very huge, of course. Right. And as you stated, Sheila, you know, sometimes you don't know until it's been going on for a very long time. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so while Social Security is not directly involved in that because usually that's kind of under the Medicare umbrella. In some instances, you know, it may be related, especially if Social Security benefits are affected or maybe Medicare enrollment uh, data is affected in some kind of way, right? And so um, Medicare.gov would be the um, first place that I would recommend folks go to um, if they feel like um, or have evidence of that kind of, you know, fraud related to Medicare claims or coverages. Um, they have a page uh, that is dedicated to reporting Medicare fraud and abuse. Um, and they give some important tips there um, about um, how to spot and prevent the Medicare fraud and abuse. If you think you spotted fraud, um, one of the things that they say is you may want to call your provider's office to ask about it. You know, they may help you understand the charges, figure out if there just might be, it just might be a billing error. It may not actually be fraud, right? Because let's face it, humans are human. Sometimes we type in a number wrong, you know, uh, th things can happen, right? Um, but if you do suspect that um, Medicare is being charged for an item or a service you didn't get, um, they give um, ways to report that. You know, um, uh, they give phone numbers as well as um, uh, web links, you know, to places where you can um, report that. So, yeah, that's that's definitely as an agency, that's what we, we would refer someone to say, all right, go ahead and contact Medicare, because that really kind of falls under their umbrella. Right. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we've got a couple more in chat. One question is, um, will we send out your notes? My guess is presentation following. And I know, Laura, you're good with that, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. then is the FBI involved in tracking scammers? And if so, how? Great question. Yeah, Gloria, I would imagine so, um, just because some of these things, um, you know, fall within the jurisdiction of FBI, and FBI is one of the many uh, federal law enforcement agencies that I know OIG works with, you know, our Office of the Inspector General. Um, so, but to the detail that they are involved in tracking and how they do it, I don't, I don't necessarily know all those details, but um, I'm, I know some of their activities are very similar to what our Office of the Inspector General does. Right. Um, so, um, so yeah, they're, they're all involved. Right. And as, as we can imagine, or, or not, we don't even have to imagine as we know, right. Just when we think about scams, we, this isn't the first time we're, we're hearing about them, right. Scams have been around a long time. So they continue to change in nature in frequency, um, you know, in, in their makeup, if you will, you know, do I kind of relate them to like a DNA type of situation, but you know, like they do, they, they evolve, they change based on, um, you know, the, the topic, uh, the, the situation, you know, there were scams related to the pandemic, of course, you know, um, so that, that definitely keeps the law enforcement agencies on their toes um, because how they investigate what they find um, sometimes uh, may be limited if folks are not reporting, right? Um, because some of the times they get some of their best leads based on the reports uh, that are submitted. And it may start out as, you know, it may seem like just my little lonely report over here in this neck of the woods. But again, it could that could be the start of, you know, truly documenting a larger issue. Right. And we have definitely seen that with some of the social security related scams, you know, so um, when in doubt, always report, you know, report, 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 you know, let them sort it out, <laughs> you know, let them determine if it matters, you know, quote unquote matters or not, you know. Yeah, go ahead, Gloria. Mm -hmm. uh, do you happen to know if anybody ever gets their money back? Yeah, um, I would say yes, they do, um, especially as it relates to Social Security. You know, I don't, I can't, I imagine it happens in other instances too. Um, but if we're able to determine, right, that a person's benefits were intercepted, you know, they went to, uh, you know, some fraudulent bank account or, you know, they were diverted in some way, we definitely um, recoup those funds you know, um, and re recoup those benefits and reissue them to them, you know, um, not necessarily in that order, right? Like if we have evidence that it was fraudulent, you know, we, we work to reissue the benefits timely to the individual and then we continue our investigation, you know, what we need to do so that um, social security is not in the hole, you know, for that. So yeah, we, we take whatever actions we need to uh, to make sure that the individual um, does not suffer any more um, adverse action as it relates to their benefits or um, and or their social security number, right? Um, it's a little harder when it comes to use of the social security number, right? Kind of like I said earlier, there's no way to suspend your social security number. We can't keep people from using it in a sense. There's no like switch that we can just turn off, you know, and on. Um, but, uh, but, but we can proactively correct your earnings record, you know, issue supportive letters or things like that to assist with other circumstances, you know, where verifying your social security number may be a, you know, maybe something that be, needs to be done. As it relates to the My Social Security account, um, you can ask Social Security to block electronic access to your Social Security information 
So like, let's say you had a My Social Security account, um, or maybe you didn't have one yet, but you've been a victim of identity theft, or you're just wanting to be cautious, you could ask us to block all electronic access so that no one could create a social security account, you know, on your behalf or, or access it. Um, those are, those are, that's another step uh, that we have available uh, for folks. So, so yeah, um, but there are a lot of instances where folks don't get money back, you know, um, and that's really rough, especially like when they've, you know, when they've diverted almost all of their life savings, you know, to these fraudulent activities, you know, there can be some challenges um, in, in recouping those, especially if we're not able to track, you know, if the, whatever agency it is, you know, if we're not able to track where the money went, you know, in our case, it's usually pretty easy because, because of direct deposit and electronic means, we are able to immediately track, you know, um, where those payments went. But that's not always the case in some other scenario. I think one of the key things that David brought up earlier is reporting. Report, report, report. I mean, no matter what, even if it seems silly, like I, sh why, why should I just do that? And um, it's so important, regardless, in time, Time is of the essence with a lot of them because then mm -hmm. people, they can move on whatever that fraudulent activity is and yeah. over report. Tell everybody, tell everybody. That's right. You know? <laughs> tell everybody. It doesn't matter. Tell everybody. And, and Sheila, I'm glad you mentioned that because it makes me think of another aspect um, about this whole, about this whole situation. Right. Um, and one, I think, one of the biggest elements is that is shame, right? People feel ashamed when they become victim of a scam, right? Um, I mean, my husband is is a uh, fifty, let's see, fifty seven. Yeah, I had to do the math there real quick, right? Fifty seven, and he recently fell victim to a scam because he recently ordered something online and it was a, there was nothing wrong with the order at all, but timing was an issue, bad timing in this sense, but he immediately got a call within maybe about, maybe about 15 minutes of placing the order. And so it sounded legit right? And he fell for it, right? Fortunately, he caught it in time and did all the things to prevent anything bad from happening. But it was a scam, you know? And so people are ashamed, right? And shame can keep us from reporting. It can keep us from sharing what occurred, right? And so I just say that to say, you know what? Don't, don't let shame keep you from you know, protecting yourself and others, right? It's, it's all right. It's happening to a lot of people and you are not alone. You are not the only one, you know, uh, that this has happened to. Even people who are hip to scam, so to say, dare I use the word hip, right? I, I guess I'm kind of <laughs> dating myself there, right? But <laughs> kind of kind of oxymoronic there. Maybe I shouldn't yeah. use the word hip, but, but, you know, even those who are, right, it can happen to all of us. So, um, you know, don't let shame keep you from uh, keeping yourself safe and others. Yep. And that is a very common reaction we have found yeah. at ARP when individuals report or share their stories. Shame is a, is a common um, reaction. So yeah. we don't want to be taken advantage of. You know, we think we're, right. we're, we're hip, we're savvy, you know, <laughs> we're with it. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's embarrassing. Um, it is the, um, another thing that I'd like to throw out there is on the state level, the uh, attorney general's office is a place for you to report scams as well, whether it's social security or another one, just to let the AG office know, because they're able to then share that um, to their offices and throughout the whole state of Missouri and even beyond. So 
um, you know, that's another uh, place to report. Again, over report, over report. So mm -hmm. who always said report? Was that um, on Star Trek? I, I can't remember. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so um, other questions anyone have? I mean, this is such a big thing, whether it's Social Security or Publishers Clearinghouse. That's a huge one, actually. It's one of the yeah. top ones in the nation, along with the grandparent scam, um, are the top ones. And it's uh, it's yeah. shocking it makes you mad actually that people do this it makes me yeah. mad so yeah um and i know there are people who have had my my sister had her social security number grabbed and they submitted a tax return using their social security this was several years ago um mm -hmm. but yeah so they had to get a new number her and her husband did so yeah mm -hmm. it's it's tragic actually yeah. Yeah. I mean, just think about all the good in the world that could be done if these energies were devoted to beneficial and productive things. Right. You know, um, yes. but, you know, the reality is it's not going away. And so, you know, the biggest thing that we can do is to be aware, um, you know, stay vigilant and um, have that healthy dose of caution and skepti skepticism. Right. Um, right. About these types of matters so do we have another question any parting last words david of wisdom that you want to share <laughs> you know i think you know I, I think we can all agree that there is a lot going on in our world right now you know there have been right for a long period of time and so sometimes we just have to focus on what is within our control, right? Um, what is within our control is using our voice, using our knowledge um, to help those around us, right? And so Social Security is no exception to that. Obviously, we are in the business of serving people. We've been doing it for, um, you know, well over 85 years now. Um, and what, even though we're facing challenges right now, um, especially, you know, if anybody's had to do business with us lately, um, I hope it was a good, you know, I hope it was a good experience. Um, but if it wasn't, um, please know that our staff really are doing the best that they can, right, with the resources that we have to, to serve the American public. So um, just keep your head up, you know, fill your life with positive things. Uh, because there's enough negative out there, right? Just <laughs> keep your head up and, uh, hey, keep coming to, to events through Mirrorwood Center and AARP. They're, they're not going to lead you astray. So, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you um, so much, David. This has been amazing. I hope uh, everyone has gained a little bit, a little nugget or two of uh, information that you can use uh in your life or and also with your loved ones as well mm -hmm. so and i'd like to thank laura and the mirowitz center for including arp in this uh amazing program and uh, laura i'm gonna turn it to you for closing comments no she can't speak okay all right so i'm gonna close it for everybody so thank you everyone um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. And um, thank you again, David, for an amazing um, session. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Take care. Bye, everyone. Thank you.